Good morning, everyone. Welcome to part three of the employer education series presented by Hen Lesperance, Attorneys at Law, Spectrum Occupational Health, and BHS Insurance. My name is Kim Slager, and I am a partner here at BHS. Today, I am joined by Terry Carlson from Spectrum Occupational Health and our presenter, Andrew Cassini from Hen Lesperance. Our topic this morning is Weed in the Workplace, Current Trends. Just as a reminder, uh, everyone participating will receive an email following the presentation with the slide deck and a link to the recorded um, presentation so that you can share that with team members back at your respective organizations. If you have questions today for Andrew as he's presenting, please post them in the chat feature. We will respond um, at the end with Q&A, and if we run short of time, we'll make sure that all the questions are answered in the follow-up email as well. We will include um, in the follow-up email a short survey. If you could please uh, answer the, the four questions that are there, providing us some additional feedback and topics you would like to hear in the future. As a reminder, next month's topic will be workplace accident investigation, and that will be held on March 18th. So with that, I would uh, just say, please uh, grab your, your cup of coffee, perhaps your brownies and gummy bears, and enjoy Andrew's presentation. All right, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, my name is Andrew Cassini. I'm a partner here at Penn Lesperance. We're a law firm based in Grand Rapids. And I chair the Labor and Employment Practice Group in that firm. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to present here today to be part of a great team. Uh, BHS and Spectrum Health Occupational do a bang up job with this kind of stuff. And today's presentation is on the topic of marijuana in the workplace. Now, in my experience that you go to legal seminars, especially when they're webinars, and they tend to cover of all of the various topics, three types or categories of topics in general. First one you can go to is you can go to see a seminar about stuff that you need to know, but you hate to learn. The example that I always give of this kind of presentation is Michigan's paid sick leave. No one likes hearing about it. Nobody enjoys implementing it. It's confusing as all hell, even if you're the most dynamic presenter in the world, and then I don't know if I necessarily have that title, but you need to know it. Then there's the second category of legal seminar where it's stuff you need to know and you love to learn it. I think these things are more rare, but there are some things that do fall within this category. But then there's, of course, the third category, which I think today falls under, which is presentations about weed and drugs and all of the other fun stuff. I don't give any rock and roll seminars, but that would be under category three. In actuality, I think that this one is going to be a combination of category three and category two. It's more than just fun. It's more than just interesting. It's something I do believe that all employers absolutely need to know. And if you haven't been to one of my presentations or seminars about this before, please know that we could take this discussion in a lot of different directions and spend a lot of different time with a lot of different areas. This is going to attempt to be a summary to help you issue spot and implement some solutions to the emerging trends and problems of increasing marijuana use and what that's gonna mean for your business. That's today's goal. And here's how we're gonna tackle that. First, we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion about marijuana history and the changing in the legal status. And even though I'm a history nerd, even before I'm a law nerd, I won't spend very much time boring you on this topic, but I do know that it's important to know that context. Then we're gonna talk about recreational marijuana in Michigan. You know it's legal, but do you know why it matters? And we're gonna be talking a little bit about usage in that section as well. We're gonna be talking about CBD, which is a topic where there's a lot of emerging interest because quite frankly, I don't think that there are a lot of people that fully understand it. And before I started repair, preparing to generate this presentation, when I initially first gave it, I didn't frankly know much about it either. We have a final section for employer responses where the rubber hits the road. And I think what you're gonna learn is the general overall theme of this presentation is that the law isn't going to be binding on you. Not all that much. There are some restrictions and you're gonna learn what those are. There are some guide rails for what you absolutely cannot do. And there's a big wide lane in the middle of things that you can. 
But within that wide lane, we have to be mindful of the practical reality. And that's, I think, the piece that's been missing from a lot of other legal discussions of this complicated topic. So again, and I promise I shall not dally, we've in America a quick history. This, by the way, if you are a fellow history buff, is going to be so abbreviated and summarized that there are going to be inaccuracies lost in the details. But I think the overall trend, if we can, to summarize the history of marijuana acceptance and legalization in our country is to think about it from uh, from the 1700s to the 1960s is occurring in three general stages. In colonial America and early America, hemp was actually one of the foundational American crops. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people know about cotton, they know about tobacco, they know about those being the classic New World crops. Hemp was one of them too. And in fact, the back of the old $10 bill featured a picture of farmers engaged in hemp cultivation. Yep, that's right. It used to be literally on our money. Things began to change though around the dawn of the 20th century, and that's when you see uh, pieces like this, the idea that marijuana was a socially detrimental and potentially dangerous drug that was going to corrupt youth and that could lead to depictions and uh, could lead to increase in incidents of violence, violent crime. Uh, and that kicked off a state by state initiative to generally make marijuana unlawful. Of course, there was a change that everybody is certainly aware of who is attending today, which is by the 1960s, however, the image of marijuana had changed in the minds of many younger Americans and public use of marijuana, although it was certainly uh, a taboo that people acknowledged was probably not something, certainly something that was unlawful and may not have been something that you would talk about with your grandma and grandpa, you know, the age of the reefer madness generation. The fact that people were using it and using it frequently was no longer a secret. The 1960s was a countercultural change. And you can kind of see that oscillation, right? It's something that's acceptable, it becomes something that's condemned, it kind of comes back to being acceptable again. And one of the responses to that was to begin to crack down on marijuana and the use of it and the legalization of it. In the 1970s, we did this thing where we passed the Federal Controlled Substances Act. This was actually intended to be a compromise law. And the reason that I say that is, marijuana legalization was a state-by-state -state issue. And you had these enormous disparities between especially the Deep South, where it tended to be an extremely serious crime for even simple possession, and places like the Pacific Northwest, where in Oregon, before uh, up, up until the early 1960s, the possession or even the minor distribution of marijuana was in some cases decriminalized, something that a lot of people kind of forget to history. The 1970s Federal Controlled Substances Act was a federal law, so it applied everywhere, and what it did was it created five schedules of substances, a big long list, and it put each substance within a category called a schedule. And within that schedule, that, that, that determined how strictly the Federal Controlled Substances Act would regulate production, possession, use, and sale. And for the first time, this is very significant, international drug possession, use, and manufacture the federal police agency, the FBI, the DEA, industries that we've built or federal agencies that we've built to counter uh, the, 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 uh, the, the use of drugs in society. This was the genesis of that, the Federal Controlled Substances Act. It's much more recent, I think, than we realize. Now, where does marijuana fall within this particular scheduling sh scheme? Right here, which is surprising to a lot of people and which was one of the takeaways of this presentation I think is most essential. Marijuana is still, as of this moment, federally unlawful. It is, in fact, a Schedule I drug. Among, uh, it's, it, it has been categorized alongside of ecstasy, heroin, LSD, methoqualone, and peyote. Now, a lot of people have disagreements about whether or not it should or shouldn't be here. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, and I'm certainly not an activist of any kind. All that I can tell you is what the current legal status is, and the current legal status under federal law is that it is regarded as one of the most dangerous drugs that you can possess or consume. Again, there are many differences of opinion about that. We can discuss some of those, but that is where it stands. And the Federal Controlled Substances Act kicked off a new generation. Remember how I said it was an ebb and flow in society about our, our acceptance of marijuana and culture? The 1980s was a decade of the war on drugs. It was an era of highly prioritized enforcement, but the thing was, 
it began to generate a lot of bipartisan criticism because the incarceration rate skyrocketed along the same time the Controlled Substances Act and the drug war began to be prosecuted. You can see a chart here of incarcerated Americans and you can watch that rate skyrocket after the war on drugs was declared around 1980. Now, there is some truth to the fact that marijuana in particular is having a disproportionate impact or it used to on, in, on American incarceration. Because of drug arrests, the vast plurality of drug arrests, both in Michigan and in most of the states across the country, came from marijuana. So in 2015, and the reason that statistic is useful for 2015 is will be revealed a little bit later. It has to do with when we legalized it. But in 2015, medical marijuana here in Michigan was lawful, but recreational was, was not. Police across Michigan arrested 23,893 people for marijuana possession, sale, use, and purchase. This represented 9% of all arrests for that year statewide. Let me repeat that. Marijuana use, possession, sale, and purchase represented 9% of all arrests for that year statewide. Now, I'm reporting to you live from Kent County in Grand Rapids, and here in 2015, 64% of all controlled substance arrests were for marijuana, which is consistent, 9% of all arrests, same as it is statewide. And you can take a look at some of the other counties, and you can see that those rates tend to be at least fairly stable and similar. Wayne, Ottawa, Wexford, and Crawford. Crawford has been included because marijuana possession, sale, use, and purchase in 2015 constituted 33% of all arrests of any crime in that county in that year. This was making a lot of people change their opinions about whether or not the juice was worth the squeeze. That is to say, whether or not it may have been worth it to make marijuana and keep it a, uh, an unlawful substance. And public perception seems to be matching that. Here, I'm gonna show you two charts. The first one over here on the left is, is US public opinion on legalizing marijuana between 1969 and 2018. They asked people across that entire uh, gulf of time from the summer of love to 2018, do you think the use of marijuana should be made legal or not? Strict percentage answers. And you can see that back in 1969, 84% of people believed, this is our Americans now, believed that it should be unlawful, whereas 12% of Americans believed it should be lawful. In 2018, uh, those percentages have begun to flip. 62% of Americans believe that marijuana should be lawful. 34% believe that it should remain unlawful. An enormous change in not a lot of time. And you can also see this chart if you think to yourself, well, that just has to do with millennials and younger people skewing and influencing those statistics. You can actually see on a generational by generational breakdown that every single different generational category is at least more open to the idea that marijuana should be lawful than they were in the past. In particular, I find the silent generation, which is the bottom line depicted there, fascinating. 15% believe that it should be lawful in 1969, but today over a third, 39% do. I think that's significant, why? Because the images they grew up with, the cultural context in which they were raised, marijuana was the, the, uh, the, the drug that could create, or they were told, uh, criminality. This was the generation of reefer madness, and yet that's what they think today. Now, the law responded to this trend and beginning in 1996, California was the first state to introduce medical marijuana legalization and a lot of other states followed. Recreational marijuana legalization became a big deal in 2012 when Colorado and Washington both decided, let's get rid of the medical marijuana scheme or let's get rid of that as being the only justification for possessing it, selling it or using it and move to just accept what is true, which is lots of Americans like to use it for recreational reasons. Maybe we'll be better off if we legalize. So what are we seeing? Well, what we're seeing is we're seeing this trend where states legalize it at first for limited purposes and then it becomes more broad. And indeed, that's exactly what happened here in Michigan. Michigan passed the Medical Marijuana Act in 2008 through a ballot initiative. Now, 63% of voters approved the initiative on the November ballot. Interesting percentage, right? Because it kind of maps with what some of those people, some of those polls that I just showed you said about public perception of legalization. The MMMA, which is a mouthful, try saying that three times fast, 
protects qualified patients who are engaged in the medical use of marijuana. And the way that, that works is you get a physician to essentially certify that you deserve a medical marijuana card because marijuana could be useful in treating some ailment, and that will enable you to purchase it in some quantity. This scheme still exists today, even though marijuana is recreationally lawful in the state of Michigan. And as of March of 2019, Michigan had issued 269,000 medical marijuana cards. It's a significant number, especially when you consider the population of Michigan is about 10 million. You can do the percentages, and that's a lot of people walking around with one of these in their pocket. Well, what did that mean for employers, though? Well, the key for employers, and we're distilling down a whole lot of case law into a simple topic, but just to make sure everybody's caught up, for employers, what is medical marijuana? What impact does that have? It was settled by a case called Cassius versus Walmart stores, which although it's fascinating, it's a little bit too much for us to go into detail about that today. The bottom line takeaway was it was a situation where an employee had been terminated for testing positive on a Walmart drug test, but he was free and gave advance notice that he had a medical marijuana card, never used it on duty, and there was no evidence he'd ever used it on duty. So after he was terminated because he was taking it for an ailment he had suffered at work as prescribed by a doctor, um, I'm, I'm sorry, he was taking it for his cancer, not for an ailment uh, he, uh, he endured at work. I crossed up two cases in my mind. Seeing for a form of cancer that he had, his oncologist recommended the use of medical marijuana. Uh, he was fired. Now the courts observed and they analyzed this, the use of marijuana is still a federal felony. That, by the way, as we talked about earlier, is still true. And it held that the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act did not regulate private employment. It held instead, that it did not insulate employees from disciplinary action for the use of medical marijuana. So you could still terminate an employee who violated the drug policy, even if they had a card. And employers were not required to accommodate medical marijuana under the ADA. The principles from Cassius hold today. That is the rule for medical marijuana and it maintains as much. The keys that are undecided as of yet are, well, one, what might the ADA do if it ever becomes lawful federally, of which there's some momentum? And two, what are other states going to do with their state disability laws? Because those do vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Michigan's Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act, it hasn't determined whether or not, Michigan courts haven't decided whether or not there's a duty to accommodate under that law in particular. But my suspicion is that there wouldn't be, and it's been since 2008, I think that we can assume that this holding from Cassius maintains in the state of Michigan. Whether it does in other states is open for debate and will emerge over time. Now, what's Michigan's law regarding recreational marijuana? Well, super simply, we voted back in 2018 at the midterm election uh, at a, by a 11 point margin, that we were going to uh, cons we were going to enact a recreational marijuana licensing use and possession scheme. This isn't a secret to anybody who's in the chat right now. Weed's legal in Michigan to have recreationally for individuals over the age of 21 who also meet certain criteria and there are certain restrictions for where you can and can't use it. But here's what I want all of the employers in the room to know. It's simple to say weed's legal. But what I think you care about isn't so much whether or not it's legal or not. What you care about is what you should do because it is legal. And I think in order to know that, you need to know the context of how many people use marijuana and in what context do they consume marijuana? And the fact of the matter is that a lot of people already use it. In 2016, Marist University conducted a very widespread study. Those are hard to do, by the way, with marijuana because it is still a schedule one drug. So it is very difficult to get specific authorization from the uh, applicable agencies to do studies on it. But Marist University concluded that 55.6 million people used marijuana once or twice in the last year when that poll was conducted. It's about 18.5% of U.S. residents had used it once or twice. About 11.4% of U.S. residents used it in the last month such that they could be concerned as monthly users. Now, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is a federal agency that also studies this, does a high school study. And they determined that 45% of 12th graders ever have used marijuana, 37% report using it in the past year, 23% report using it in the past month, and 6% report using it daily. In other words, it is true that the younger generations are using it disproportionately as compared with the population as a whole. You can compare those two groups, the Marist University group and the National Institute on Drug Abuse group together. 
But what's also significant? 12th graders back in 2017. Well, those 12th graders are going to do are right now. They're doing one of three things, right? They're going to college, junior college or a vocational school. They're in the military or they're working for you. And that matters. Now, broadly, a lot of people already admit they use marijuana, which is a different statistic than those who actually do because it suggests whether or not a cultural taboo still exists. Now, I love the question that this uh, Gallup poll has asked Americans every year since 1969. This is the way the question is worded. Have you yourself ever happened to try marijuana? Which is hilarious, right? It's like, did a marijuana accident occur involving you? But back in 1969, 4% of people were willing to admit that marijuana had ever happened to them before, which definitely means that a big chunk of the others were lying. Today, however, and this ends in 2018 is the last year of this study, 45% of Americans were willing to admit that they had. Now, look at the shape of that graph. And you notice there's a little bit of a hockey sticking at the end. And you can carry over. OK, well, why does it begin to rise sharply there? Ah, 2012. That's when marijuana first became lawful in Washington and Colorado. So you see that not only is it society that influences the law, law also influences society. And this isn't rocket science. More people are probably going to be willing to use a substance that is lawful versus one that is not. It's also significant that a lot of people don't think marijuana is unsafe. Now, this is public perception of safety, not expert perception of safety, but public perception of safety matters because the public's going to be the one making the decision to use it. Also, your workforce isn't composed just of experts who are wizards who wrote the tome on marijuana safety. It's composed of members of the public. So what the public thinks matters to you as an employer. 72% of Americans believe regular alcohol use is more dangerous than regular marijuana use. 76% say the same thing about tobacco. And that's interesting. We could get into a digression. We don't have time for it here. Mapping and charting the use of tobacco as measured against marijuana. And the shortcut is that for individuals under the age of 26 in America, they are more likely to consume marijuana than they are to consume a tobacco product within that age cohort. That's pretty interesting. 67% believe that marijuana it, it, uh, marijuana is safer than prescription painkillers. And 56% of Americans say the recreational use of marijuana is socially acceptable. I have so many anecdotes I could use to prove this, but I think it stands to say the number of times that I have seen individuals at parties or gatherings of professionals, of people that are just like me, that are just like you, that are HR people, that work in businesses that are C-suite individuals who are willing to use it on a special occasion, like a holiday, like the 4th of July, begin to look around. That number is increasing rapidly. And as it increases rapidly, more and more people are going to be willing to try it because the taboo will fade away. It has already started to. This may be a point that you're going to say, well, duh, but let's measure it. More people are also probably going to start using marijuana now that it's lawful. I love this study. This measured monthly marijuana usage in Colorado, and it measured groups, uh, the same cohorts, people from the age of 12 to 17, people from the age of 18 to 25, and people over the age of 26. And what they're asking is whether or not they use marijuana on a monthly basis. And they have two cohorts. The first analysis occurs in 2009, three years before marijuana is recreationally legalized in Colorado. And then they measured again in 2015, three years after. And what do they find? They find that within the two groups where people are able, it contains people who are able to use it lawfully, you need to be over the age of 21 to legally purchase it in, in Colorado. Incidence of use, uh, monthly use uh, increased by a third for the 18 to 25 year old cohort, and it doubled for individuals over the age of 26. This is highly significant. Why? 18 to retirement age is your workforce. Now, we're not in Colorado, we're in Michigan. We don't know yet what the rate will be three years after legalization because that'll be 2021. We don't know statistics for the end of the year. Also, statistics for 2020 have been very hard to keep because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But let's commit a act of statistical malpractice and let's apply the same rates of change that we saw in Colorado 
to the 2015 monthly usage rates as measured by the National Institute of Drug Abuse. The predicted rates for what we would see among these three cohorts is that in the 12 to 17 year old cohort, about 8.4% of that group is anticipated to be a regular monthly user, a number that I think is very sad and that probably a lot of focus needs to be addressed toward. Within the 18 to 25 year old cohort, we could predict an increase up to 32.3%, so approximately maybe about a third will be monthly users within that category. But the age of 26 or older, I think that's the one that really forced me to stand up and take attention. I think it should make you take stand up and take attention too. About 10% of people in 2015 were monthly users of marijuana in that age cohort. But if the same rate of change that we see in Colorado applies here in Michigan, and hey, it may well not, but it may, we might expect in 2021 to see 20.1% of people being monthly users of marijuana walking around and doing things at the age of 26 years or older. In other words, somewhere between one third and one fifth of your workforce probably uses marijuana on a monthly basis if you're large enough to be a sample of the overall population. Again, a third to a fifth that deserves your attention, even if you don't condone it, even if you do reject it, that's where we are in all likelihood. And we can take a look at the trends to see marijuana being sold, and we can see more and more marijuana here in Michigan is being sold each month too. Uh, the following depicts a, uh, the chart is in billions of dollars over on the left-hand column. You can see the month by month. This is from the Michigan agency that tracks marijuana sales, which is a crucial part of the marijuana legislation package. And you can see that that number is only increasing. And you can also see there was a big spike when the pandemic started. What do you do when you're home at work, home from work? It also probably means that more employees will have marijuana in their system while at work positive test results are going to be likely to increase. Now, Quest Diagnostics, when they measured this, reported that the nationwide marijuana test positivity rate increased 11% for 2019 as compared to the prior year. 4.5% of all employee drug tests came back positive. That's nationwide though. In Michigan, we might expect that it's higher and it was. In Michigan, that same number was 5.6%. So again, this isn't just measuring regular users because for a lot of employers, you know when you're gonna get drug tested. So this probably involves, this is with people trying to avoid it and 5.6% is the return. Now, since 2015, post-accident drug test positives increased 32%. It is unequivocal. There is no way to slice any of these numbers. The number of your employees who uses marijuana on an irregular basis is going to increase. Just that's the end of the story. It's just going to happen. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean people will ever be using under the influence while at work. That's a different issue. We'll talk about that in a moment, but it does mean that the number of people that are likely going to be able to test positive because of the durability of the marijuana metabolite in the system is only going up. And our policies, which need to exist and actually be implemented in the real world, need to reflect this fact. Now, I stress in saying that I'm not telling you what to do because Proposal 1 does not mean certain things for employers. It does not require you as an employer to permit employees to possess or use marijuana in the workplace. I hope that's obvious. But it also does not prohibit an employer from disciplining or discharging an employee for violating your workplace drug policy or for showing up for work with marijuana in his or her system. So let me make sure that I stress that. If you wanna maintain a zero tolerance policy and you want your workplace to be a model for future workplaces, you wanna use that ability to, to shape and change things to make sure that you're participating in a drug-free America, you're certainly entitled to do that. The question is, how many good qualified applicants who would never come to work under the influence are you gonna to need to turn away to accomplish that goal? That's the subject to be explored, and that's the challenge presented by marijuana legalization in the state of Michigan. Now, the next topic we're going to talk about is CBD. And, uh, you know, CBD, it's, it, I think the best way to say it is it's, it's kind of like Bitcoin in that I don't know what the hell Bitcoin is, but I have to pretend that I do. And that's the way that I felt, at least until I sat down to put together this presentation, or at least the first draft of it. And so let me kind of introduce you to what I've learned. Again, not a doctor not a scientist, 
But I am an employment and labor lawyer, so knowing this and knowing what the what the effects might be in the workplace is crucial for me. That's why I've learned, and that's what I'm here to talk with you about. Okay, so this is getting stoned one on one with our professor, Dr. Snoop Dogg. Uh, the difference here uh, between hemp and marijuana is crucial. Hemp and marijuana are kind of like cousins. They're plants that are similar, but they're a little bit different. Hemp is over there depicted on the left with some of its criteria, uh, characteristics, marijuana over on the right. We can take a look at this slide in the printed uh, handout that you're all going to be distributed electronically after. But the, 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 the crucial distinction here is that hemp and marijuana aren't exactly the same. They probably used to be at some point, but since then, because of the process of evolution and selective breeding, they have diverged into two separate plants and entities. Now, CBD is short for cannabidiol, cannabidiol, cannabidiol. This is why, by the way, I went to law school because I'm not really a science or a math person. Let's just call it CBD. CBD is, the pro is a product that is derived directly from the hemp plant, the hemp plant being, of course, one of the many different types of cannabis plants, and it's kind of like a cousin to the cannabis plant. And CBD can come in a bunch of different products. It can be in edibles, capsules, it can be in vape liquid, oils, it can be administered orally, it can be rubbed into the skin, because a lot of people claim it helps with joint relief. Now, why is this different, though, from THC? How do THC, the active, the psychoactive, uh, uh, chemical in marijuana. How does it differ from CBD? Well, marijuana's psychoactive effect is caused by THC. It's a type of cannabinoid. Cannabinoids are the active ingredients in marijuana and in hemp, but there are a lot of different cannabinoids in marijuana and hemp that are found in those two plants. You can see a lot, a big long list of them there with their molecular structures. And what we're interested in is the second most prevalent one, which is their CBD. The key though is what does CBD actually do? Well, it's widely thought to have various medicinal benefits. Anybody that listens to the Joe Rogan podcast will certainly be familiar with some of the benefits that he extols being a former combat athlete that deals with a lot of pain and um, you know, generally kind of a spaced out wild dude. Some people claim that it can lead and, and, and generate pain relief, inflammation reduction, nausea cessation, so that people especially who are on things like chemotherapy or other drugs that make them feel very ill can actually manage to hold down food. It can have anti-anxiety properties and it may be able to alleviate depression. And if what I've just described to you sounds like, well, that's the holy grail, man, you have decent reason to be skeptical if you are. The reason that we don't know a lot of these things conclusively is kind of our own fault, but the fact is we don't have scientific and medical consensus. Why? Again, marijuana is a Schedule One drug, and we can talk about why CBD is available lawfully in just a moment, but the fact of the matter is we're behind on doing some of that research. Why? We couldn't do it lawfully because we classified marijuana as a drug that had absolutely no benefits of any kind and at a high degree of, of likelihood of abuse and addiction. Again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, I'm not advocating, I'm not saying those things are wrong. I am saying, however, the direct effect of the fact that marijuana has been a Schedule One drug has prevented us from learning a lot of things about it. And now, of course, we're all kind of the guinea pigs. Now, science has reason to believe, there has been enough study conducted to know that not all cannabinoids have the same effects in the body. And you can see here that CBD and THC is over there, CBD is over here. But the real takeaway that is supposedly true about CBD, and there appears to be a decent amount of scientific vetting about this fact, is that CBD is non-psychoactive. That's the idea, at least. It doesn't get you high. It creates all those other properties, supposedly, but doesn't get you high. That's at least the reason that it holds promise for a lot of people, but again, many of those effects haven't been vetted by the medical community. This is crucial to understand. Now, the CBD hype train, huh, I love that photo. Of all the photos I found in my presentation, that might be my favorite one, just fits in so perfectly there. But anyway, the CBD hype train, it's not gonna be slowing down anytime soon. Forbes magazine predicts that CBD sales by 2022 will reach $22 billion nationwide. Now, more than half of states have enacted mer me uh, medical marijuana laws, and more than 10 jurisdictions allow adults to use ma marijuana recreationally, meaning about 75% of Americans live in a state where there's some way to get their hands on legal weed. But the question is, how does CBD apply within that scheme? 
Now, some states are in the business of legalizing and regulating CBD. Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Texas, Wisconsin, Wyoming, among others, those are all states that have directly tackled this question. But for the other states, it's kind of existing in a hazy area. Did you get the pun, hazy? All signs point to an increase in other states to follow suit, but for right now, Michigan doesn't have a lot of CBD specific legislation, meaning it's a federal issue. And here's what we did. Industrial hemp, or IH, was legalized on the federal level, which meant that it was exempted from the DEA Schedule One drug list through the 2018 Farm Bill. Now, the Farm Bill isn't a very sexy piece of legislation, so a lot of people didn't notice that that happened, but it did. 2018 was a significant year in Michigan for the use of cannabinoids, right? We had recreational marijuana get legalized, and we also had the industrial hemp bill at the federal level. And um, the reason I have this awesome picture right here is because George Washington, actually, his family estate, he was a plantation owner. I know that is a fact that is today of some troubling historical validity, considering he, he did own slaves who worked on that plantation. And those slaves were engaged, at least some of them were, in the process of cultivating hemp, which was, alongside of tobacco, the two primary crops that George Washington used to farm. Well, hemp's back, baby. Now, industrial hemp is classified and defined under the Farm Bill to mean a cannabis plant with less than or equal to a concentration of 0.3% THC by weight. In other words, cannabis plants that have this, that are below this standard are believed by the legislation at least, which is based on some medical research, but again, we don't have enough of it to really be sure, but it is believed widely that a plant or a product that contains less than 0.3% THC is deemed to have no psychoactive effect. It's kind of like how there's some alcohol in kombucha, but it's not nearly enough to actually constitute any fear of getting someone drunk. Same kind of idea. Yeah, there's a little THC in there that's the psychoactive effect, but industrial hemp has been bred to be different. That's the purpose of industrial hemp, and that's why it's classified differently. And again, the, the Farm Bill's significance and impact is hemp has been now differentiated from other cannabis plants. So now we have this category where we can have low THC weed effectively. But the Farm Bill also preserves the FDA's authority over cannabis and cannabis derived product, including those derived from industrial hemp, which of course means CBD is now regulated not by the DEA, but by the FDA, meaning there are rules. So what is the bottom line takeaway? Industrial hemp is legal with serious restrictions. And since CBD is an active component of marijuana, the FDA prohibits CBD from being introduced into the food supply, which is one of the reasons that I've represented some clients that have started either small scale bakeries or something like that, or breweries that use CBD in their products. And that's very, very difficult to make that legal. It also prevents them from marketing CBD as a dietary supplement. And if you have a CBD product that contains more than 0.3% THC, it's federally unlawful. Why? Because it's not a CBD product anymore. It's not industrial hemp after it gets over that threshold. It's marijuana, which is federally unlawful. Now, again, the rules may differ on a state by state basis. And what's the takeaway? What's the problem here? Well, the problem is that CBD right now, it's tricky to regulate and we're determining the level of CBD in the plants that we grow based on the process of genetic evolution, which is an imprecise, although over time, uh, inevitable uh, science. So the point is this, the level of THC in any particular tincture that you pick up at a store, the level of THC in that tincture, that little jar, that bottle with the dropper, and you put the little drops under your tongue of CBD, it may contain more than 0.3 THC. There's no way to tell. The manufacturers try to do spot checks, but this creates an HR nightmare, right? Because here's the problem you're faced with as an employer. Your employees may use CBD because it's been marketed to them. They understand it to be. Joe Rogan tells them that it is not psychoactive. Doesn't matter, right? They're thinking to themselves, ah, this is the safe weed that I can use to make me feel less anxious without any drawbacks. But it will contain some THC. And maybe that level of THC is above the threshold such that not only is it unlawful to possess, but perhaps the consumption of CBD could trigger a positive result in a drug test. Oh no, you're in a pickle. All of this may be confounding. So the next section we're gonna talk about here for the last 
20 minutes, we're going to talk about employer responses. What should you do based on the new prevalence that we've already discussed of recreational marijuana and now of CBD in your workforce? Well, let's start out with the rails. What can we do? You need to know your rights first. And two things are true, neither of which has changed, but it's worth a reminder. You are generally permitted to adopt whatever drug-free workplace policy you want to adopt and to make whatever employment decisions you want to make regarding marijuana use by any particular employee. You're also allowed to refuse to hire a prospective employee because he or she failed the drug test if the drug in question is marijuana. The question is not, can you? You can, and I'll be happy to help you if you need a path through the jungle to get you to the point where it is barred by your employer. The issue though is, do you want to? And if you do want to, how do you do it? Because in law, like in many things, the devil is in the details. Now, let's get one other big, uh, one rail, one category, one categorical way of thinking about this out of, uh, out of the way at the onset. Although there's no federal law that directly regulates drug testing per se, the DOT regulations, Department of Transportation for Commercial Drivers, that is to say folks that have to have a CDL, they're subject to the Motor Carrier Safety Act, and the Motor Carrier Safety Act is applying federal law. The bottom line, you are required under the Motor Carrier Safety Act as the employer of people with CDLs to uh, enact certain drug testing requirements and to consider marijuana as a prohibited substance. There's no legitimate medical reason necessary for such a test. But again, in the DOT regulations, you do need to adopt a scheme where you use them, and you also need to treat marijuana as a prohibited substance under them. What's the takeaway of that? Well, the takeaway is this. If you are an employer and you have a DOT covered position, which is to say, you have a job position where someone is required to maintain a CDL as a condition of their job, you only have one choice with respect to that employee, and that is to keep your zero tolerance policy. There isn't an exception that you can trigger yet. There may be if marijuana becomes federally lawful, but for right now, any of your employers that are within a DOT covered position or any of your employer employees that are uh, within a category that is covered by some of the executive actions that require a drug-free workplace, the Drug-Free Workplace Act in particular, that's for some federal contractors. If you're with, if you're an employee, if you have employees that are within those categories, that is to say they're doing work that is covered by the DOT regulations or the Drug-Free Workplace Act, you have one choice and one choice only, zero tolerance. And in fact, this was the best practice for years. What do most zero tolerance policies look like? Well, they prohibit marijuana. They usually require, but not always require, pre-employment screening. You need to take a test and you need to do that before you're eligible to be an employee there. They almost always feature reasonable suspicion testing, testing that gets triggered when you have reason to believe that an employee is under the influence of some substance while they are at work. We did a seminar on that a couple of weeks ago, which is available, I'm sure, by distribution. Um, Kim and Terry will uh, be passing around some stuff and you can get the links to take a look at that if you want to, or you can talk to me about it. And these zero tolerance policies usually permitted an employee to conduct post-accident testing as well. Post-accident testing is testing that automatically happens whenever there's an on-site workplace accident. Somebody gets bumped with a forklift, both the driver and the bumped employee need to go get their drug test afterward. Now, zero tolerance policies, and the reason that it says I love the 90s down below it is because that's when you used to see these most prevalently. They come from the late 80s, the 90s, and if you're an employer that hasn't touched your employee handbook or thought about this issue since then, you probably have a zero tolerance approach. They almost always mandate termination for presence of any prohibited drug or drug metabolite in the employee's system. That includes marijuana. That's why they're called zero tolerance. Now, if you maintain one of these, I'm not telling you that's unlawful, and I'm not even telling you that's the wrong thing to do. I am telling you that you need to hold up for a second. And the reason you need to hold up for a second is because, well, there's a problem here. <clears throat> Now, I think the best way to think about this is think about alcohol, right? You don't want your employees showing up drunk to work. You'd fire an employee who did, and I would strongly advise that that remains the case. 
you cannot show and tolerate you cannot tolerate employees showing up to the job site under the influence. But it's not like you have a rule saying that you don't hire people that drink. I mean, I'll say it. I don't think there's any social taboo. I enjoy a nice cold glass of rye whiskey on the rocks sometimes at night after a long, hard day. I wouldn't say I do it frequently and I try not to do it to excess, but I definitely do it. And my employer doesn't care. And chances are you as an employer don't care about that either. The only thing they care about is that they don't want me coming under the influence. Uh, they don't want me coming to work under the influence. The same thing you don't want from your employees. That's what's important, not what they're doing on a Friday night, what they're doing on a Monday morning. There's a problem, and that is that marijuana is not like alcohol in one very important respect. Employers can test directly for impairment with alcohol, and we also all know just from the cultural context, the signs of alcohol intoxication are something that you see depicted in the media all the time. People are familiar with it, but that is not true with marijuana. You cannot test directly for impairment with marijuana. Marijuana instead stays in the system for a long time. Now, these numbers are always changing. And as weed becomes a more widely prevalent thing in our society, we're going to develop new technologies. But as for now, the consensus seems to be that a blood test will have marijuana metabolite stay in the blood for about seven days, urine test maybe up to 19, hair more than 30 days after use. The bottom line is this. There is no weed breathalyzer. There is no weed breathalyzer. There's no way right now to test for present sense impairment. And this has caused a lot of employers to rethink their strategy with respect to drug testing. One example would be the UFC, the Mixed Martial Arts Fighting League, which recently amended their policy about marijuana use to, quite frankly, remove it from the list of prohibited substances. Why? Well, let's hear the UFC take, give their take on it. We want to continue to prevent athletes from competing under the influence of marijuana. And we've learned that urinary levels of THC are highly variable after out of competition use, that is to say the Friday night use, and have poor scientific correlation to in-competition impairment. It is therefore not an ideal marker in athletes to indicate in-competition impairment. The bottom line is that in regard to marijuana, we care about what an athlete consumed the day of the fight, not days or weeks before a fight, which has often been the case in our historic positive THC cases. And I'm telling you right now, it's also the case with a lot of your organization's historic THC positives too. Now, again, you may not care. Maybe you think to yourself, well, I told you at the beginning of your employment that marijuana wasn't a, was a prohibited substance. I expect you to abide by that. But the bottom line is this. The statistics are the statistics I'm showing you. And if indeed there is a day where person could freely admit to using marijuana on a Friday night, but never dreaming coming to work intoxicated, just as I did when I talked about how I enjoy rye whiskey, well, then you're going to have an awful lot of employees where they're going to use it only off duty, but you're not going to be able to see that from a drug test. Now, the latest and greatest technology is purported to be oral swabs, but even these measure exposure, not impairment, because they determine the presence of the metabolite in the saliva. And again, the problem is the metabolite sticks around longer than the intoxication does. And there's a debate about how much the duration of exposure is, but it some, appears to be between 20 hours and six days from ingestion. And worse, it may not functionally respond very well to edibles, which is rapidly becoming a way that many people engage in their marijuana consumption. So what's the problem with all this? Well, the problem with all this is as follows. It's pretty simple. We care about impairment not exposure, but we don't have a method to precisely differentiate the two. And these are the people that are exposed. So if you do a test, those are the percentages of people that you can't tell whether or not they're impaired. The bottom line is this, who do you wanna weed out of the workforce? This guy or this guy? Well, I tell you what, you can't tell the difference from a drug test alone. And that's the problem. Therein lies the issue. And you, the, if you take a strict approach either way and you say, well, we'll just not drug test, then you can't uh, eliminate the category two. And if you take a strict approach and say, hey, we're just going to go to zero tolerance, uh, Elon Musk is not going to be the genius behind your company anymore. Now, the impact of this is actually a little bit more disturbing, I've found, because 
We say zero tolerance, but what does that actually mean? Well, it actually in practice means that some animals are more equal than others. In other words, what are we actually doing as a result of our zero tolerance policy? Well, sometimes we're tempted because we get back results we don't like. If one of our most reliable employees tests positive, even though we know he's not the kind of guy, we know John's not the kind of guy to ever come to work intoxicated. He's one of our most conscientious guys. Well, if you have a zero tolerance policy, you've got two choices. He test positive because he was maybe involved in a completely innocuous accident on Tuesday morning, but he says, hey, just so you know, I smoked weed Friday night with my friends. I knew I wasn't gonna work till Monday. I feel fine now. Either you're gonna have to fire him or you're gonna have to violate your own policy. Neither of those outcomes are particularly good in that case. So what are the alternatives to a zero tolerance policy? Well, there are some alternative approaches that are emerging here. These deserve some consideration and discussion. One option is that a lot of, of employers are moving from a zero tolerance to what's called a gold star or a one strike policy. Gold star or one strike policies, there's a difference. The gold star policy and one strike basically gives employees a chance to test positive under certain circumstances without that automatically mandating termination. Now, in the case of a gold star policy, only certain employees are eligible. In other words, you have to have, for example, a perfect disciplinary history or a perfect attendance record and no previous drug, positive drug tests of any kind. And obviously, we're not applying a gold star or one strike policy to a situation where there's reasonable suspicion of impairment. Again, if we have reason to believe based on a reasonable suspicion analysis combined with the test, demonstrate somebody's high while they're at work, they need to go. The issue though is to try to figure out and give some leeway for the Friday nighters. And a gold star policy provides that opportunity. You get one get out of weed test free card if you have the perfect employment re record and past and if it's not a reasonable suspicion test or a post accident test in most circumstances that we also don't usually apply it to post accident testing. A one strike policy is a little bit more forgiving where they just give everybody one bite at the apple. They give everybody one strike you can have one test during your duration of employment that comes back positive. It's forgiven, no questions asked, but any subsequent test essentially puts you on an informal weed only LCA. Now, another option here is that we could do THC exempted pre-employment screening. A lot of employers are taking this tack. Pre-employment screening, of course, is an employment screen that you do, a drug screen that you do before you get the job. Now, Spectrum Health Occupational is, is one of the many services, and I think the best service that provides uh, occupational drug testing. And one of the things they're beginning to offer instead of the classic five slash 10 panel tests, which tests for, let's see if I can do it off the top of my head, uh, THC in the five panel test, THC, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, and, mm, ooh, I don't know what the other one is. I failed my own test, regardless. They've begun to move from a five panel slash 10 panel test to a four panel slash nine panel test or a four panel slash eight panel test, which is removing marijuana from one of the substances that gets analyzed there. And the reason for this, I think makes some sense, right? Even if we believe that we want our employees to be on notice that if they smoke weed while they are an employee of ABC Incorporated, they are subject to termination at any time. If that's the place where you want to go with your end, end result policy, well, there's no reason anymore that you could necessarily believe somebody that smoked weed a week and a half prior to coming in and applying for your job is going to necessarily continue that conduct moving forward. Now, I think that the pre-employment drug screen when THC was involved was actually kind of an employee stupidity test. But now that many, 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 many more people are using marijuana recreationally and there isn't a strong taboo or any criminal penalty in the state of Michigan, at least associated with that, I think those rates are beginning to rise. And a lot of employers are responding to this by saying, now we'll maintain THC screening for our reasonable suspicion or post-accident tests. We're just gonna do away with it though for pre-employment. Another possibility is getting rid of pre-employment altogether. Reasonable suspicion and post-accident only testing programs are something I'm implementing more and more. And depending on what kind of workplace you run, if it's an office setting or IT, something that's more informational, that may be the wave of the future. Now, what does a law say? Law, one question I get asked a lot is, do we need to accommodate? Just to say, do we need to allow an employee upon their request, if they have a medical condition, to use recreational marijuana, medical marijuana, or CBD? 
Well, in the case of at least medical marijuana and recreational marijuana, it remains federally unlawful. And the ADA actually contains a statutory provision which prohibits the use of a controlled substance, which it is in federal law, from being a reasonable accommodation. In other words, it's carved out of the law and it's clear. You don't need to accommodate marijuana use under the ADA. No jurisdiction to date has required an employee to accommodate recreational marijuana use under a disability statute, but there have been some states that have done, uh, that have taken an opposite tack for medical marijuana use, medical marijuana use. Now here in Michigan, as I mentioned earlier, the Persons with Disabilities Civil Rights Act has never been interpreted to require accommodation of medical marijuana. And the medical marijuana statute appears to hold and echo that, but the legal situation is less clear in other states. <clears throat> and although we can't do the state-by-state -state analysis now, if you're a multi-state employer, feel free to talk to me after class because some states have held that their state disability law does require the accommodation of medical marijuana. And you need to know about that if you're operating across the country. Now, what about CBD? Oh, that one's tricky. Well, there's no way to test a CBD product to determine whether or not it has lower than 0.3% THC content at the consumer level, okay? Again, that tincture you hold in your hand, it may come from a factory that creates, by and large, THC-free product, but does that tincture, that bottle in an employee's possession actually fall under that threshold such that they will not test positive on a drug test? No way to know until, of course, you give them the drug test. So what do we recommend doing? We recommend that your drug policy specifically informs employees that CBD is a prohibited substance if it tests positive in a drug test. In other words, this is really the message you're giving to your employees. You can use CBD, but use it at your own risk. Now, there may be a complication to come down the pike, but that isn't here yet, which is we might find a series of court cases where accommodating CBD use becomes a necessity under a state or under a federal disability law. We haven't seen it yet. So my advice for the time being is to regard CBD in the same boat as marijuana. In other words, say, be warned, if you use it and you abuse our policies, if you use it in violation of our policies, we can and will terminate. And you specify those particular substances are included as prohibited substances. Take it all together. That's so much information. But I wanna leave you with this last slide. And this, by the way, we'll, we'll include it separately as its own individual handout. This is my seven step process for marijuana compliance. It's a compliance checkup. If you're an HR person, do this test, run it either in conjunction with counsel or on your own. I think you do these seven steps to determine whether or not you're stress tested for the changes that are coming. First, you need to get real and you need, may need to do education at the C-suite level about how many of the current employees and potential applicants are likely to smoke marijuana. If you still have a, an organization where the culture remains from a time where we could assume that only criminals smoke marijuana, I think it's time to change that as your mindset, not out of any moral obligation. I'm not making any criticism of anybody for what they believe. I am, however, making the the, the, the empirical observation that many, 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 many more people smoke and use marijuana than even a decade prior. We need to get real about that. And we need to make sure that our policies reflect that reality and the strategic vision. Next, you need to ask yourself, do you have a drug policy? And even if you do, have you updated it in the past decade? If you don't have a drug policy, full stop, you need one today, see me after class. Even if you have an old one though, it's probably time to dust it off, which is something that I can help with, or you can contact your current Labor and Employment Council. Ask yourself next, does your organization need to be zero tolerance in whole or in part because you have employees who are covered by the DOT regulations or by the Drug-Free Workplace Act? That's the next question you need to ask. If you have certain employees that are, it's possible to carve them out by their job classifications and apply different rules to them as to everybody else but you need to know about it and you need to decide whether or not that is a situation that your employer is in. Next, I think you need to ask yourself, what do you wanna do with pre-employment and random drug screening for non-DOT uh, or Drug-Free Workplace Act employees? My recommendation is that the random drug screening days, unless it's mandated by a federal law, a federal regulation, or by a CBA that you've negotiated with the union, 
I really believe there are some, but not many employers for whom random drug testing makes any sense anymore. And if you do have a random drug testing policy and you're thinking about that, and you're concerned about it, that's a great thing I'd love to talk with you about because probably we do need to change that now. It's right in some circumstances, but not in nearly as many as it was even a year ago. Next, ask yourself if zero tolerance is right for you with respect to your non-DOT DFWA employees. Is it time to move to a gold star? Is it time to eliminate, uh, eliminate THC from your list of screened substances? Is it time to do away with drug testing altogether? Six, you need to ensure that your policy can be actually followed. You need to sanity check it at the end, and then you need to commit to doing it and not doing the some animals are more equal than others game where you pretend you're zero tolerance, but you're actually not at all. And then finally, and this is perhaps most important, you need to educate your employees about what your policies actually say. I have this old adage, and I, it's an old saw that I learned from a mentor a long time ago. It says, this guy told me a long time ago, 5% of employees are troublemakers. They're terrible. They'll look for any way that they can to exploit the rules, get away with doing anything they can, uh, try to fly under the radar, avoid work at all costs, and make your life generally hell. You probably spend about 50% of your time on that 5%. There's another 5% of employees who are, they're exceptionally conscientious people where they want to help their organization above all, they're gems, they want to be there for the long haul. And then finally, I think you've got the remainder of that group of employees. And those are people that just want to do their jobs to the best of their ability, follow your directions and go home. And if they don't know what your prohibited drug policy, what your drug policy or alcohol abuse policy says, they're not going to follow it. So you need to educate your employees about that. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all that I have for you today. Thank you so much for your time and attention. It is truly an honor to speak in front of you, and I'll be sticking around for as long as we need to to answer any questions and to distribute materials after. I only wish we could have done it live and in person. Take care and have a great day. Thank you, Andrew, so much for a wonderful presentation. Again, appreciate all the history that helps us understand what we should be doing today. I did have one question I wanted to pose to you, and it's an industry-specific question. Um, you mentioned obviously DOT requires that we implement and keep, but what about um, the healthcare space with skilled nursing, uh, working in, in nursing homes or um, acute rehabilitation? Is there a trend in that industry at all as to abandoning the THC? I don't think there's a trend in those industries yet, but I think especially with a position classification by classification, that's going to be creeping up in a lot of those facilities. We think about them as being patient care centers, right? And they are. We need to maintain the absolute epitome of safety and health for the clients that they serve. However, they also employ, this is just a true fact, especially about most large hospitals or most long-term care facilities, they employ a broad spectrum of different professionals and people to make the, make the situation work. And you're going to be drawing from populations that are going to be using marijuana, and it's not going to be restricted only to the lower level employees. So if the question is, am I seeing the trend? Not frankly yet, I'm not seeing a lot of changes. Do I think that there will need to eventually be a change? Yes, or I think that there's going to eventually be a, and I say nothing about these particular professions, but I think there's eventually going to be an LPN, a CNA shortage, because quite frankly, <clears throat> um, if you're making $18, $20 an hour, that may not be your only career. And maybe you aren't willing to make a major lifestyle change to do it. I think one of the ways of thinking about this issue is, how would your workforce change if you said, we're not gonna hire any alcohol drinkers here, not just people that would never come drunk to work, we're not gonna hire any alcohol drinkers here. I think a lot of employers probably on this line right now are thinking to themselves, that would never work. And I think that marijuana, although I never think the prevalence is going to be as high, it's gonna approach that standard. We need to be ready for it. Well said. Well, thank you everyone again for attending. We look forward to hosting you on March 18th, where we will be talking about workplace accident investigation, the importance of it, the best way to conduct it, the benefit you see from, from doing um, due diligence in that area. Again, thank you for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you so much all for your time. Take care.